So good afternoon, uh, everyone. I hope you had a, good, a great uh, lunch break so far and a good DEF CON day. Thanks for joining us. This is a virtual session. We're going to talk about some cloud topics. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of introductions, as Dino was saying. And then we have some prepared topics that we're going to cover around computer and infrastructure, uh, IAM and security, some networking, and other cloud topics around rigor and cost control in general. Then we'll save some 10 minutes or some time for Q&A. So please feel free to start posting them. And I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Alex Dimitri. I have been working on distributed computing system for around 10 years at this point. Uh, I have completed a full migration for a financial services company before from on-premise to the AWS cloud. And I have joined Clearwater Analytics uh, as the team lead for the cloud engineering team in the December of 2019. So it's been a great year so far. And I'm going to uh, introduce or pass the mic for my panelists to start introducing themselves. I'm going to start with Dana. Uh, so feel free to start intro uh, your introductions. Hey, everybody. My name is Dana Salk. Uh, I have been working on the cloud engineering team since March of this year, actually. So I'm fairly new to the entire environment, but it's been super fun to learn. Uh, before cloud engineering, I was also doing some data engineering at the company. So I've had quite a bunch of different experiences to bring to the team. So that's been really fun. All right, let's head over to Tom. Yeah, I'm Tom George. I've been with Clearwater for five years now, initially starting off on the what is now the SRE team. Um, and I moved over when we formed the cloud team about a year ago. Um, I'm fairly experienced with everything that is in the Clearwater system, as well as um, we've been doing a lot of cloud research and a lot of learning on cloud, so. Perfect. Gonna head over to Ben. All right, I'm Ben Mauser. I'm, I'm on the odd, the odd duck out here. I work for Cradle Point, um, and I've been at Cradle Point for about six years and working on cloud stuff um, for about eight to 10 years, so. Awesome. And then we'll wrap it up with Brian. Oh, Brian, you need to unmute. There we go. Hi, I'm Brian <laughs> Sheldon. Someone had to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's classic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a DevOps engineer on the cloud engineering team um, with uh, Tom, Dana, and uh, Alex. I've been started doing Linux when I was like 12 years old. And I did some high performance computing at the University of Idaho and at Washington State University. So then I came to Clearwater and I've been here for about four years doing all kinds of different technical roles. Um, so yeah, that's me. Perfect. So let's get started with some of the topics. Uh, the first one we have on the list is to talk about a little bit of the current state of modern compute platforms uh, in the cloud. Uh, we've seen the impact obviously of different sort of solutions from Kubernetes, uh, containerization as a whole, uh, serverless but also the recurrence, a recurring presence of uh, classic virtual machine workloads. So I'm gonna open up with a question for Dana uh, and let's start thinking about what do you see are the advantages and disadvantages that you have experienced so far, uh, either in between classic EC2 virtual machines versus more containerized or serverless workloads and, and let's get them together uh, in sort of a comparison. Definitely. Uh, I've actually had quite a bit of experience as of late working with EC2 instances. Uh, one of the biggest benefits I've found is that we can actually use EC2 instances to move our legacy applications with containers onto EC2 instances. And it kind of makes it really easy to just hold whatever kind of application it is in a container and launch it into the cloud. Uh, but of course, there are some disadvantages to EC2 instances. Uh, instance provisioning can be fairly expensive. Uh, if you're doing on demand, but you know you do have a lot of uh, benefits of doing new servers all the time on demand, whatever you want. But you know the thing is that the entire configuration and spin ups can be pretty uh, technical, and if you don't know how to set up EC2 instances, it can be an issue. So uh, Lambda serverless is an example, right, of something that you could do that is serverless. Uh, there is a lot of advantages that you don't have to provision any of the hardware, but at the same time, there's uh, the reaction time for servers can be kind of a problem. There's warm up times involved. The large data has an issue with serverless. So, yep, yep can different, place definitely in. different problems. Um, yeah. Do any do any of you have any other insight on on the matter? Just as a general opening topic. 
Well, I'm mean, gonna say that one of the biggest things is management as well, is yeah. uh, EC2 instances, you have to deal with operating systems, you have to deal with the operating system updates, uh, maintaining security, all that fun stuff, where serverless and containers, the operating system is either managed by a central group or the operating system is managed by a external service like AWS. So, mm -hmm. like, yeah. Um, Last point on that one too is that when you're just putting things in containers and EC2 instances, you're not getting rid of that tech debt that you're kind of you know carrying with you from on-prem applications into the cloud. So, that's true. Yeah, there, there's a, there's an interesting trade-off that can be made there, right? Um, when you take the steps to containerize an application that could also be a good enough step to do some moving and improving uh, as you're moving up into the cloud. So uh, speaking of Kubernetes, Tom, uh, you have a really good uh, amount of experience here I've seen at Clearwater with Kubernetes and, and creating systems that can leverage uh, this orchestration. Can you think about some, uh, some, some ideas or something you wanna share that can be said about Kubernetes that can help a company migrating from on-prem to the cloud and maybe not only that, but also how a company can stay pretty fluid if in between cloud providers or adopting multiple cloud providers with Kubernetes at the same time. Okay, yeah. Um, first thing first is with the migration, if you're migrating a legacy service or an on-prem service up into the cloud, making use of Kubernetes will help you um, the orchestrator of Kubernetes will help you do a lot of things that you were doing on premises that you did not have, that you would have to redo in a cloud provider. Good examples of this are uh, system properties, uh, service discovery with DNS, um, the other things like, um, man, I'm losing my mind now, uh, secrets, secret, secret stores and stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of additional pieces that the Kubernetes orchestrator provides you, but it also provides it, provides it to developers in a very, very easy API interface where everything defined in Kubernetes is a YAML document or a YAML store within the Kubernetes infrastructure. So it makes it not only easy to migrate your things, but also for the developers to work with their items in Kubernetes. The other really nice thing going to your other point of Kubernetes is it is cloud agnostic. Mm -hmm. All the cloud providers provide a Kubernetes service of some sort, or you can run your own version of Kubernetes in pretty much any cloud provider. So building your service or setting up your service to run inside of a Kubernetes environment does not lock you into any cloud. It can be migrated be in between and go across multiple clouds. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely something to help you stay more fluid on the edge also of trying to understand as we're going to explore later cost in a cloud environment and how it can affect the workloads. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now to just to get exposure a little bit also from Ben, as you said earlier, you uh, at least come from a different company than the rest of us here. So do you have any example that you wanna talk about of maybe moving from a regular EC2 or a workload of virtual machines on-prem, maybe with a classic configuration management in mind uh, to systems like Kubernetes in the cloud? Yeah, so at Cradle Point here, the, the, the SaaS platform that I work on was, was written with cloud first in mind. Um, so when we first were, um, had the service, we deployed into Rackspace. We eventually then moved from Rackspace into Amazon. Um, but in those cases, we dealt with virtual machines in Rackspace and the EC2s. Uh, within the last couple of years, we've migrated from a static you know, you know, EC2 type of deployment which is, you know, a really akin to deploying with VMs, right? We treated them as pets versus cattle. And, right, right. Um, we've then moved them all into Kubernetes for our, our main workload. So those nodes and pods can go up and down as we need. Um, and it allowed us to address some of the tech debt on our DevOps side of the house. Um, as we've all had experience, I'm sure, migrating pieces from one system to another, there's always pieces where like, all right, I'm going to get to that DevOps stuff next time <laughs> next time yeah later <laughs> <laughs> right the move from rackspace to amazon for us right like, okay well we knew how to do this we use chef we knew how to install the stuff with chef so we're just going to do it this time um but that deployment methodology is so different between the ec2 and the kubernetes it really allowed us to level set and, and rethink how we want to handle this and kind of change how we treat our applications nice nice that's that's great to hear 
Um, you guys switched gears a little bit on this and we were able to like take advantage of some of this feature. Uh, Brian, I'm going to, I'm going to pass the mic to you this time. And I'm going to say, do you have in your experience, uh, any favorite Kubernetes feature that you want to share or that you think that can be something that a lot of our audience can start using today in their cloud movements? Yeah. Um, one of the biggest things that excited me from the very beginning of when I heard about Kubernetes was just the ability to focus on, you know, what you're wanting to do on a system and not, you know, on, on building an, an instance and having an operating system and making sure it's patched and has the right software. You get it, you know, there's a lot of pre-work that you normally had to do to get to a point where you could either use your code that you've written or use some software out there all that kind of just gets chopped off and it's handled by a central place that's managing the cluster for you. And you get to focus on, okay, I want to do this thing. Cool. Let's just dive into it. Let's, let's build a container that's based off of some image that I can leverage um, either internally. So it's, you know, secured and just be able to be free of that, you know, that whole precursor and just focus on the, on the task at hand and getting um, value out of what you're trying to do. Um, I've worked a lot in IT in my past and having to like patch things and making yeah. sure security vulnerabilities are dealt with um, across like thousands and thousands of VMs, you know, yeah. you, you don't get to just forget about security with Kubernetes, but you get to kind of like uh, maximize your, your, uh, your time and get like just the Kubernetes worker nodes patched and, and dealt with. And then really in your pods, you just have to focus on making sure that the software that you're using is up to date. And that if there's any issues there, then uh, you can get those up to date quicker. So it really allows you to kind of break the components out of those two things yeah. and get them to different teams even and let them focus on those solely. Yeah, I think it, that's, that's an excellent point. Like focusing really down to maximizing developer productivity in this way, just opening up for our developers to not have to worry about anything else. But at the same time, for us, I share a similar operations background as you shared and uh, having to deal with patch management. And something is to be said also in AWS, for instance, EKS, we use managed EC2. So we have even less to worry about from that point of view, which is really interesting. Now, that being said, uh, whether or not we all know Linux is usually an engineer or maybe even a developer's favorite operating system, we all have to deal with Windows sometimes and orchestrating those platforms in the cloud. Dana, I know you recently had some experience with Windows. Uh, do you want to share something about starting workloads or moving and orchestrating Windows workloads in EC2 uh, in the cloud? Yes, uh, Windows has been complicated. <laughs> uh, what we have found is that, of course, EC2s are good for that legacy software, right? So what we can do is we can move that Windows setup that we have on-prem uh, straight onto an EC2 instance. But what we found is that the process for building those EC2 instances, we've been able to kind of automate it. It's a well, partial automation of those processes. We'll have a very manual automation or a very manual uh, setup for depending on what kind of software like InDesign that we're working with. And then building mm -hmm. those AMIs, uh, the best case scenario we found is to create that base image for those Windows servers. And then from a base image where we kind of have a good setup, we create more EC2 instances that you know we could start with. So uh, again, it's, yeah, the complications that come with some of those uh, really dependent on what kind of Windows server you're looking for. So yeah. many different problems have come out of that, so. One thing that I can think about speaking of this is in general, also from a security point of view, thinking about EC2 and containers, the necessity with EC2 to have to drop in the console. Uh, can any of you speak or attest of what you do about this? Uh, do you guys use SSH? Do you recommend some internal, for instance, Amazon protocols such as uh, system manager, session manager? in order to shut down certain sensitive port, like port 22, for instance, in your security groups? I'll take first crack at that. Okay, <laughs> let it go. So um, we, we don't use a Bastion host anymore. Um, for our legacy system, right, we used to use Bastion hosts, um, uh -huh. you, you know, go through and put all the restrictions around for MFA, all that fun stuff. Um, and we've moved to using SSM for those replacing or those nice. areas that you still need access to machines for an operational use case. 
Um, and then also leveraging the, AM, or, uh, the coop control exec command um, for those other pieces that are inside the system. Um, you know, and then locking that down through some BPC NACL rules, um, you know, for who's allowed to run those commands and leveraging IAM quite a bit. Yep. Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent segue actually for the next section of what we wanted to talk to the audience, which is a little bit of security in general. So if you've ever uh, seen on the news or like you read some technical focus publication in general, uh, usually if you associate vulnerability and incidents uh, in the cloud, many times it has something to do about IAM, a role-based access control, or S3 buckets. So let's explore a little bit of that. And I'm going to toss it to Brian, because uh, I know that over here at Clearwater, Brian has done a lot of work about securing our infrastructure and securing our IAM policies. So do you want to talk a little bit about how you run IAM, challenges that you've found uh, working with uh, your development organization about getting that perfect least privileged role as it is from the well-architected framework? Yeah, um, IAM is a very powerful system, but um, it has such depth and complexity. Um, and there's so many different ways to use it. You know, you've got people that are accessing your, con you know, AWS console using IAM and you have, you know, Lambda functions that are using IAM. So that it's, it's leveraged across so many different services. So when you're having to talk about IAM, you have to really make sure everyone's on the same page and understand a lot of the terminology because it really gets deep quickly. And just understanding, especially with us, because we have multiple accounts underneath the AWS organization. So we have cross account trusts that have to be established and how's that going to be done? Um, those are some of the big challenges and, and also representing what a person is going to do in an account and trying to figure out what the scope of that is going to be because there's some interesting limits in IAM, such as yep. like how many policies you can attach to a role, which is 10. You can up upgrade it a little bit past 10, but... And then each policy can only have so much in it. So you, you oh. deal with this balance of like, okay, granularity and being very sp specific and doing the least privileged, but a balance of like the limits of what a role can handle. So you, you have to find this balance between a role that is specific enough to do the work someone needs, but not so general that you start exhausting all of your policy oh. document lengths and how many you can attach. And I think that's the hardest thing to deal with because there's, there's only so much material out there to help people with that. So really thinking about that beforehand and then also not being too invested in something that you invented, be very willing to like change it. Like oh. we've had very many iterations on our team of how we've approached IAM. And I can't believe like what, what we started with, you know, eight months ago to, yeah. to versus what we have now. Um, there you very much an evolving sort of a, of subject in a sense. And would you recommend to our audience to leverage um, SCPs, for instance, at the organization level uh, to help? SCPs can be can be a nice thing to sprinkle in to your IAM system, but mm -hmm. they come with a lot of interesting things that you have to be very careful about. Um, one of the things that we that we realized is when you make one I, uh, SCP policy and you apply it to all of your accounts, well, if you make a modification to that SCP policy and there's any issue with it, you just instantly affected all of your accounts all at once. So making sure that you break your SCPs out into like you know environment level SCPs, and there's also some interesting caveats to how SCPs work. They look just like an IAM policy, but when they get processed, there's some differences between how they do explicit denies and allows on allow statements right. and deny statements. So you really got to de dive deeply into the documentation for SCPs and find a good spot to test it, all of your assumptions out first. <laughs> yeah, and then I, another issue that brings forth using SCPs yeah. is it makes it very difficult for developers to simulate their policies and understand that an SCP could be blocking their access to something because yeah, it's yeah, not that's, that's really true. One, yeah, one yeah. other thing to expound up on that, uh, one, something Brian mentioned is the fact that we do have lots of different accounts. And so we do have to deal with the complication of cross account roles in a lot of situations. But one of the reasons we actually went with a lot of accounts was to help with IAM simplification, IAM um, isolation. Because IAM is such a complex system, if we can isolate the scope of where we need to allow permissions in, in AWS's case, in the accounts, um, we can simplify that piece while it does shift a little bit more complexity elsewhere. 
Yep. And uh, I'm going to take that as a perfect uh, segue or layup because uh, I know I can speak about it, but I'll open it up, for instance, for you to Tom, because I know you worked a lot on this, but uh, during our setup of our guardrails in AWS, we exactly ran an evaluation of what you were just talking about and using what AWS sometimes talk about as their natural uh, ways of delimiting control across accounts by splitting in multiple accounts, but leveraging instead a shared networking module uh, to simplify communication. And you want to talk about a little bit of what we did as a shared VPC model and sharing subnets. And uh, yeah, just uh, walk our audience through that. Yeah, so the model we're using here at Clearwater is we, we ran into a few problems from the very beginning. One, if we used big central accounts that lots of different people had access to, we had lots of IAM complications. But if we split up all of these little things into lots and lots and lots of little accounts, the VPCs are tied to an account. So you would have a lot of network configuration. So VPC peering, transit gateways, communicating between VPCs adds a lot of uh, complication there on the network layer for doing lots of accounts. But Amazon does provide a way for one account to own a VPC and share out subnets of that VPC out to other accounts. So other accounts can build up EC2 instances or other Lambda resources or something like that tied to those subnets. Um, so what that allows us to do is get the kind of the best of both worlds where we've got the IAM simplification within the accounts, but we've also got the network simplification by isolating to fewer VPCs and um, only sharing subnets. One huge ad added bonus to this is there's lots of different types of subnets in Amazon. There's public subnets, private subnets, transit gateway subnets, uh, database subnets. So you can set up the security on all these different subnets a little bit differently, but only certain accounts actually need access to some subnets. If you're not making a public, a publicly available service, you don't need access to a public subnet. Right. If you don't have a database, you don't need a database subnet. So yeah. this also adds the bonus of us being able to only share the subnets that are actually needed by the account. Again, coming back to least privilege, yep. um, share those subnets to the accounts that actually need to use them. Yeah, no, no, those are, those are all excellent points and, and brings up to mind also wanting to know and share, Ben, uh, if you wanna also share what you guys do uh, about your networking model and, and your yeah, IAM so, models. So what we do is we, we, we at one point had a bunch of accounts like you uh, mentioned, and we actually consolidated back to the single accounts and oh. removing a lot of access for developers to be able to access resources in Amazon and moving more towards um, having to use some form of automation um, to get the access that they needed. So rather than try and you know, push that information out there and try and restrict IAM down, we, we did other hooks for developers and people who are on call to be able to manage the resources they need. Um, and then, you know, an on-call, you know, escalation path for the operations group that will have full control within the, that Amazon account. I see. Uh, did you see any advantage or disadvantage in any of the two models? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, the reason we, we consolidated back into to fewer accounts is we're going down a path um, of a, a cellular-based architecture uh -huh. um, where yeah. we can, you know, stamp out a mo more multi-tenanted versions and everything through automation with Terraform and Terragrunt. Um, to, you know, to stamp out brand new resources um, without having a lot of manual interaction. So what we really wanted to do is try and see how we could do this with as few manual steps as possible. And that's why we kind of rolled it back into um, fewer number of accounts in this case. Interesting. You touched base on, on a keyword uh, that I was going to explore a little bit. You mentioned Terraform. I want to I wanna take the opportunity for all the audience, regardless of their experience with this, to strike how important it is when working on cloud systems uh, to try to keep your infrastructure as code uh, or to use code for your infrastructure, uh, namely as much as possible, not only for replicating things, but for instance, that, like you said, you know, to be able to deploy stuff on the fly, um, open self-service model. Uh, obviously, in this round, two large players in the AWS realm is obviously CloudFormation, which is the native solution from AWS, and Terraform, as you mentioned. 
So uh, Bena, can you think about any, I know you have a background also in software development. Uh, so you've been helping out a lot for our team and uh, to, with infrastructure as code. Can you think about differences or when or where you would recommend one or the other, or you know, just share your experience? Um, well, I know we started with some CloudFormation on our team and uh, it was, okay, it was kind of tough to work with CloudFormation and launching things uh, that way where it was a little more difficult to build those templates that we wanted. And I think when we found Terraform, it was much easier because of course I like the coding aspect of Terraform a little better uh -huh. where you can have more functionality than you can have with CloudFormation. And now CloudFormation comes with many benefits, but Terraform really allows us to either, uh, you know, Put things in the cloud wherever you know whenever we want launch those and apply those changes or roll them back as well and that kind of automation i think has been uh very valuable for our team and working on a code base together out of a repo mm -hmm. like that for terraform has been also massively useful for us to be able to read that code together see what each other's doing see what our commits are um versus maybe storing some of the cloud formation and cloud stacks and you know that kind of level so yeah yeah and um Brian, I know that you also explored uh, other plugins, for instance, that work with this, like the CDK, for instance. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit of that or some challenges you've seen with that or, you know, just in general? So, yeah, so both the both CloudFormation and Terraform both have CDKs, uh, Cloud mm -hmm. Developer Kits, that allow you to you know, use a lot, um, languages that software developers are much more used to, you know, using Python, TypeScript, Java, to yeah. be able to um, represent your infrastructure in an actual higher level software language because um, both Terraform and CloudFormation, you have to use their kind of desired language that, and you have to be pretty explicit. They want you to be like resource, um, map a resource to an actual, you know, block in code. Um, and as soon as you start to get more advanced in that, where maybe you want to do like a loop over a single resource, <laughs> right. it starts to get very challenging very quickly there in, in different ways in both of those different languages. But the CDKs allow you to get more pragmatic about that and, and think about, okay, how do I loop through things and how do I build this complex representation on my infrastructure? But doing that pulls you away from maybe fully truly understanding what you've deployed in your Azure infrastructure. Because right, right, right. the CDK let, lets you abstract it a little bit more. But if you never really look at the at the infrastructure as code that's produced by these tools, and then you deploy these things, you may not have a full awareness of what your system is and what it needs, you know, what SNS topics are there, what lambdas, what roles and policies, what that all looks like. So if there's any issues, it can be more challenging to approach your system and troubleshoot it. So if you're gonna use CDK, just make sure that you really understand the infrastructure that it's generating. And Absolutely. I think it's very valuable to check that infrastructure as code into version control as well. Yeah, yeah. Because these CDKs can change over time. They're pretty new. Yeah, and, the, and there could be also sometimes we've seen it for ourselves, situations where you don't, might not have a choice. I think Tom, you encountered that directly when you were uh, writing our module for Kubernetes. Yeah, um, when we were very first looking at, we were using CloudFormation pretty heavily because we wanted to promote that for the developers. So we had to you know, eat our own dog food and try to use yeah, it for, ourselves, for, our, for our infrastructure. But what we ran into was that while the EKS uh, endpoints and APIs had a lot of the structures for, in our case, logging, private endpoints, stuff like that, the CloudFormation um, code, the CloudFormation objects hadn't been updated yet to be able to support those items. Where Terraform had already been, so all the Terraform providers, the AWS provider, was able to use those API endpoints and API objects. And in those cases, it was like, okay, well, we cannot do this with CloudFormation, but we can with Terraform, so we're going to do it with Terraform. Yep. Yeah. And then other situations that come to mind could be if your organization, uh, we're not currently, but if your organization is multi-cloud, Terraform obviously does a great job of uh, being sort of like the linchpin across all of these different uh, different situations. Ben, uh, I'll, I want to go back and uh, hearing some, uh, some of your experience also at your uh, company. So one thing that we have struggled with and we have, we're doing some improvements and we are constantly looking into is management of our security groups and management of our network, network ACLs and how to stay secure, but at the same time, enabling developer productivity. 
what approaches have you guys taken uh, in this realm? Yeah, so for the, you know, the network ACL side of thing on the, the VPC, that's controlled really through, a, you know, a tight group of, of people, right? So if an application needs to open up a brand new port, um, we, we force conversations um, to make sure that, you know, it makes sense that an app developer wants to, up, you know, open port 22. It's like, we should probably have a conversation about that. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that balance between, well, like I'm that. a developer and, you know, I just want to do my thing um, and, yeah. you know, locking it down in security. So, you know, at the high VPC level, um, we make sure that there's like, you know, a few different hoops you have to jump through um, if you need, you know, new endpoint or new ports open. Um, on the security group side of thing as well, um, that's managed through um, a dedicated um, Git repository with config as code that you know, same kind of people have to go through and review. Um, once you're inside of our Kubernetes cluster though, and you, you know, we work, we use Helm to manage our Kubernetes system. Um, there's a lot more uh, freedom in that case for developers to control what ports are open internally to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, we have audits that go through, right, and automation to see what's open there. Um, but we give a little bit more freedom there inside the cluster as a trusted environment for, for what's open and available. Generally speaking, though, um, it's, you know, the standard, you know, port 443 for HTTPS and, and other things like that. So. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm going to do a quick uh, time check. We're at one thirty, So right now we would be around the time where we would want to take in some questions. Uh, I haven't seen any uh, open question on the chat, so we can still continue talking about some other topics that we have prepared, but at any time, please feel free to add more questions. Uh, again, going back to security, uh, being obviously an important topic, both for public cloud and a financial company in public cloud. Uh, S3 buckets are always known to um, have some recent large vulnerability had uh, S3 buckets uh, involved in it. So Dana, as we have worked on S3 buckets before and thought about security posture for those, is there anything or any simple and easy recommendations that you can uh, give to our audience as to how to make their buckets as secure as possible with the minimum possible effort? Definitely. Uh, the secure thing you can do, I would say is just no public buckets. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. no, but uh, but along those lines, uh, I would say best case scenario is like a very specific bucket policies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that would be best case scenario. Make sure that your access is locked down on that bucket, and you know what is coming in and out of there uh, for access. Uh, the other thing I could mention too is just auditing. Make sure you audit uh, your buckets as much as possible. Track what kind of traffic is also going in and out of those buckets as well. It should be massive. So, gotcha. So we have received a question from our audience. Uh, and so I'm going to start. Uh, Michael has asked, where are we? Uh, and, I, and I'm assuming that's a little bit of a question in general for uh, our company as well. But where are we on the effort to support multiple instances of an app in the dev tier? So to give a little bit of background on that, so the stuff we have migrated over to Kubernetes or excuse me, to Kubernetes and to AWS so far, we have one VPC that is the development VPC. There is a Kubernetes cluster inside of that development VPC. And currently, when we do the deployment, um, there's only one instance of that application in that Kubernetes environment currently. Um, so what that means is when developers are doing a feature branch or doing a hotfix branch or something like that, the only live running instance in that development branch is what's currently being active. And that makes it really, really difficult for developers, multiple developers on the same team working on the same project, but maybe working on different hotfixes or different features to try to troubleshoot some stuff. We have spoken with the SRE team a little bit on the, on the CICD pipeline for this. And what we would like to do is basically have the CICD pipeline set up automatic namespaces inside the Kubernetes cluster for these types of instances. Um, where the effort is on that, it's still in the talks and the design phase. We have not done any, any implementation, mainly because of time constraints on other projects that are and been happening at Clearwater. Yep, and that's, that's definitely an interesting topic that we'll, we have this concept of a parking lot that we have uh, developed in our team where we 
uh, try to make sure that all of those things that sometimes in a migration or in a large project you think is good to have and then you never really track. We're trying to do a really good job of that by tracking them and trying to assign someone to be able to carry that project forward. Uh, I don't see any other questions at the moment, so I'm going to start talking and introducing uh, another really important topic uh, about cloud, which is obviously managing cost. So uh, I'll, I'll ask Ben first, and then I'll ask Brian uh, also as well to have at least two voices on this round. But Ben, how do you guys manage budgets, costs, or do you use any external tools? Do you have a, what is recently called a financial operations or FinOps team? So we have a, a couple of people within our, our company that look at and manage the, the, the overall cost. So the way we do our cost structuring is, you know, it all ends up funneling in through, you know, a specific group um, versus, you know, individual accounts. So if you're not familiar in Amazon with the idea of a consolidated billing account, um, I'd recommend looking into it because it'll make your yeah. POs easier. <laughs> you're not using yeah. that already. <laughs> um, but we do that and then um, we found over, we used to use an external tool to help us manage and see how we were using our cost and reserved instances and stuff. Um, but we found over the last couple of years that actually Amazon has done a lot better for us and we have a lot better tooling to, to use the built-in tools in Amazon to give us a good view of where our cost is being spent. Um, so we've actually moved back to using just straight Amazon tools. Um, and when we have questions, um, you know, reaching out to our Amazon reps as well. Good point. Brian? Yeah, we, we also do consolidated billing for our organization as well. It does make things a lot nicer. Um, it also introduces some challenges if you're trying to like kind of show what part of the PO came from what parts for costs. It's just yeah. one big number. Um, so there's a lot of cool tools that AWS provides. Like Ben was saying, you know, there's... Um, cost allocation tags where you can promote a tag that you've defined across all of your accounts. Everybody can add like a project tag or a department tag. And then for within the org, you can promote that tag to be a cost allocation tag. And then using their cost explorer service, you can then get granularity on that, that uh, dimension of cost. Cause they always, always provide like, Oh, this account costs this much or this um, this service is costing this much and you can kind of get in there really and look, but not always it's it, those, those tagging, having a really, really rock solid tagging strategy is so important, especially for costs and being able, being able to discover what's costing. We set budgets per account that we create and we look at, uh, cause we talked about earlier about having to make uh, smaller accounts for our, our IAM access. And that also gives us the ability to set a budget for the entire account. Um, as well. And we usually default at some, you know, lower number. And then we have budget reports that are going to different people. And we also make sure that the developers in our accounts have access to the budget service itself and can see what their, you know, their costs are, and they can set up their own alerts and their own budget reports as well. To, yeah, there are times where it comes up and something's costing money, all of a sudden, you got to figure out what it is and try to keep it from happening again. Yeah, really important to strike that on that side of ownership uh, for everyone uh, when it comes down to cost. Uh, so we have a question for the audience, from the audience. Nathan is asking, what is the largest benefit that you guys see uh, that a development team will encounter and will see after a cloud migration is completed? Okay, I can take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the largest benefit I see short term is our scalability and uh, ability to support. Previously at Clearwater, we kind of had a central team, the SRE, what used to be the set team, um, managing and doing all the support for all of the projects across everywhere. And it was just, it was really just too much for them as well as we have the problem of our scaling of our resources is not there. So for a development standpoint, as we move towards the cloud, the developers will take much more of a role in troubleshooting, which will help the developers become better developers because they will see the actual problems that their services are doing, as well as it hopefully will start addressing the problem of our scaling of the specific services and the developers can see what their service that they're taking ownership of needs to be able to scale to. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And with that, to add to that real fast too, it depends on like how you do your, your cloud migration too. Like if you go through the cloud migration with really, you know, maintaining your old biases and your old beliefs um, that maybe you had on prem and your IT organization, then you might end up in after your cloud migration with a very different set of pros and cons than if you really embrace DevOps mentalities while you're going through the process. Um, yeah. So really quickly, we have one last question. I'm going to open it up for Ben this time. What is the one security concern that keeps you up at night? <laughs> I think that the one security, if, if, if I can only have one. <laughs> yeah, that, that, is, that is actually a good uh, luxury to have. <laughs> if you could only have one, I think that the, the most common one that I've, I've had myself and talking to other people is kind of giving up control of some of the things that you used to do yourself to uh -huh. other people. Right. You, you might have comfort like in your head about, oh, I'm encrypting my EC2s at rest with my EDSs. But before, like I could go physically see that drive and it was safe. Um, and now it's somewhere else. Right. So you have to get yeah. trust out to your, your vendors, really, that they're they're doing what they say they're doing. Right. Amazon and Google and Microsoft won't let you walk through their data centers for an audit. Right. And they, they just won't for, for their own security reasons, right? It's yeah. the fact that for, as a customer, I'm glad that they don't let someone else do it. Um, right. so you have to trust them. So I think letting that trust out and having that vendor for your data and your customer's data is probably the biggest concern. And then when you start to get that trust, then you're like, well, how do you get access to it? And all of those other things that stem from it with these bastion hosts and other tools. But I think a lot of it comes down to, you have to really trust someone else a lot more. Yep, definitely, definitely something that takes time to get adjusted. Anyways, we are at time. So thank you all for participating. Thanks for our audience for asking questions. Uh, this was a great session. I definitely had, uh, I've learned something from Ben also and you guys, thank you so much. And uh, that's it. I'm gonna pass it back to Dina and uh, thank you for joining. All right, thank you all. Thanks everyone. Please don't forget to take the survey. I posted a link in the chat, but um, next sessions I believe start at two o'clock. So um, make sure to check out the program and pick a great session. Thank you again to all our panelists. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Bye too. Bye.